hppodcraft.com. Certainly, we were in one of the strangest, weirdest, and most terrible of all the corners of Earth's globe. I have said that these peaks are higher than the Himalayas, but the sculptures forbid me to say that they are Earth's highest. That grim honor is beyond doubt reserved for something which half the sculptures hesitated to record at all, whilst others approached it with obvious repugnance and trepidation. It seems that there was one part of the ancient land the first part that ever rose from the waters after the earth had flung off the moon and the old ones had seeped down from the stars, which had come to be shunned as vaguely and namelessly evil. Cities built there had crumbled before their time and had been found suddenly deserted. Then, when the first great earth buckling had convulsed the region in the Comanchean Age, a frightful line of peaks had shot suddenly up amidst the most appalling din and chaos, and Earth had received her loftiest and most terrible mountains. Hello folks, we are here in our sixth episode covering H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And I'm Chris Lackey. And I'm Ian Colbard. Welcome back, Ian. I'm glad to be back. This week's episode is brought to you in part by the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society an alternative universe since 1984. Find out more about them at CthulhuLives.org. We've got a sponsor, guys. <laughs> you know, I wanted to bring those guys up anyway because um, we've talked a lot about Ian's, uh, the reason that Ian is on the show, because, Ian, you, you uh, adapted and illustrated a graphic novel adaptation of At the Mountains of Madness yeah. put out by Self Made Hero. And uh, people have been picking it up that listen to the show and, and really enjoying it. Oh, good. If, if you guys haven't uh, read that yet, Go over to Amazon. We'll put a link up. You can pick that up. But also, I wanted to say the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society did a great uh, radio drama adaptation of this story. They did. You, you've heard that, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've heard it many times. I listened to it in preparation for this show. It's it's yeah. really good. They stick true to it, and they wrap it in this um, broadcast. Like, you were a listener of the of the original broadcasts. You know that they right. sent back to the Arkham Advisor. It was it's really well done. It's really clever. Um, and it comes yeah. with if you get the CD, it comes with a bunch of great stuff it comes with the pictures and drawings that they did oh really little props oh yeah news clippings and all the yeah it's it's really cool Oh, that's cool well we'll put a link up to it you can go over to their site uh, at cthulhulives.org and, and pick that up they also just acquired uh, we were talking to those guys didn't they just they got a german film Some they do people on the forums when we did Col- color out of space had mentioned oh you should check out this uh, german adaptation defarb uh-huh. and actually i think the Lovecraft Society is now the American distributor. Of I stuff. don't think I know, and they're not the ah. they're not the the American distributor. They're the world distributor. Oh my! Yeah, they they love this movie so much that they are taking it under its gigantic uh, Lovecraftian wing. Their membranous wings. Yeah, it's well. First of all, it's in German, so beware. Mm. But you can get it for twenty dollars. Beware. <laughs> beware. <laughs> These um, subtitles you can have uh, subtitles right. in a bunch of different languages. I think it's subtitled in English, French, Spanish, Spanish. Usually. Yeah, Spanish. Spanish, a bunch Cling of on. A, a lot Japanese, I think. I think there's even a Japanese one as well. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure all of them, but still, uh, it's twenty dollars yeah. plus shipping and handling. There you go. So there you go. And I think that if you live in the UK, you're going to be able to get it through Paul McLean's uh, Yog Soth Off site, Innsmouth House. Oh, cool. There's a bevy of products to buy if you love this kind of stuff. So there they are. And uh, why? So where did we leave off? What was going on in the story? Our two protagonists, Dyer and Danforth, have ventured into this ancient city. Down in the Antarctic, things went wrong. Some people died. They don't know exactly what happened. There's a fella missing, Gedney, and a dog. And they're going into the city just trying to find out why it's there. Some kind of, And we're, we're getting kind of a history of ancient Earth. What really happened? Dyer sort of uncovers everything that had happened by looking at the art of this ancient civilization. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is the civilization of the specimens that they had discovered right. uh, while, they're, while they're out there. Which we call typically the elder things, but uh, they've been re- they're referred to as the old ones in this story mostly. So when they had found Lake's camp where all this stuff had gone down, some of those specimens were missing. So those are still at large as well as Gedney and the dog. Right. They went, they learned the whole history of this city. We went through that in past episodes. And where they are now is the city of last residence. Yep on the part of these elder things. They've taken the story all the way up to there, and that opening quote that we heard was one of the opening paragraphs from Chapter 8, which is where we are in the story. By the way, that was read by Joe Freya, who's been our reader the whole time, and, and 
throughout this episode will be accompanied by the music of Reber Clark, as always. Yep. There, there are higher mountains even than the ones that they're at now. This is when yes. they learn that there are some other mountains beyond where they're at. That right. they couldn't see because of the mists or, or what have you, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that, the, that these mountains, the old ones themselves, don't go there. Right. They said that those places are forbidden. We can't talk about even what's there. It's horrible. Yeah. We don't go there. They'd, some of them had made strange prayers to that mountain. But, yes. Yeah, nobody even dared to guess what lay beyond or, or go near or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. And they talk about also that very well could be the old Nakotic whispers about Kadath in the cold way. So maybe that is where Kadath is. Yeah, I thought that was odd. So... Yeah, there are hints that the terrible land beyond is Kadath. Kadath didn't seem that terrible when we were reading that story. Well, if you remember, Kadath is where flipping uh, Nyarlathotep was, and that's how you get to Azathoth. Right. Which is the crazy god at the center of the universe. Yeah, so I guess it is pretty terrible. And they have night gaunts there, too. And they'll tickle you. Tickle you. <laughs> tickling people. Well, well, you know, one thing I thought, though, before we move on, so he says that, you know, he studied the emotions on these carvings of the other things. What does emotion look like on the face of one of these weird things? Yeah, I mean, how would you know? That I thought about that, too. I'm like, wait, how does he know? Because a lot of emotion for humans, it's in our face. It's expressed in our yeah. face. And these things don't have faces. So how is he getting this? I mean, I imagine that even if you were looking at one, you wouldn't know how it feels. But then if you look at a drawing of one of them, how would you? I, I just imagine it's got to be the Scooby-Doo kind of thing where they're waving their arms around and running in circles. You know, <laughs> might have a thing for expressions because then you have a cat in an earlier story that dies with a horrific expression on its face. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So maybe it's all in the faces. Yeah. One one thing I want to bring up, we haven't talked we don't talk about it too much, but we've got really great forums on our website. Yeah. Mm. And I've been cruising the forum over there and people have been writing about our show and there's a few things that they, they brought up. One of the things that I totally forgot about like a, a chump remember how we were talking about nakotis and we don't really know anything about it yeah because of the nakotic manuscripts right sure. nakotis is the name of the city that the yithians are from and live in yeah which i totally forgot. yeah wait a minute don't you do another podcast with that name in the title yeah, you do. i do yeah. no it's from nakotis i didn't i totally forgot nakotis was the name <laughs> of because we haven't done shadow out of time which is a story right. that's coming up and it explains yeah. all of that all that stuff. So that's where the Nakotic manuscripts come is from the Yithians. Duh. I'm totally forgotten. Well, Sorry. hey, while we're in the mode of doing that, I said something wrong in one of the earlier shows. And this is kind of related to where we are in the story right now, where they, they learned that the reason that the Elder thinks finally deserted this city that they're in right now is because it just got too damn cold. You know, they went to a, an underworld kind of abyss is where they wound up going. Now, that cold put an end to the fabled lands of Lomar and Hyperborea. Mm-hmm. I mean, in an earlier show, I had said that uh, the early Conan stories were called the Hyperborean Age, but I was wrong. They're called the Hyperborean Age. Right. Now, Hyperborea is a land in the Conan mythology, yes. but that whole period is called the Hyperborean Age. So I was wrong about that. And somebody corrected me on the forum. So they're not really connected. Well, they are. I think that Hyperborea, Hyperborean is just a shortening of Hyperborea. I've been reading those lately, the early Conan stories, and they're incredible. You've been sending me emails. You've been quoting certain parts I of it. Know. And, man, that stuff is great. <laughs> it's good stuff. And, you know, it's, it's got the good sword and sorcery. It's so different than Lovecraft. He it? writes fights incredibly well, doesn't he? Yeah. There's fights and chases. and But the horror and the sorcery is all Lovecraft stuff. Yeah. The monsters are unnameable and unknowable and weird and tentacled. And the, when the sorcerers call magic down they're calling things from the outside and, the, and that kind of stuff it's really cool yeah but conan doesn't faint no conan doesn't faint in fact sometimes folks will see something and freak out and run because it's so horrible uh-huh. but for some reason conan's mind the way it works it doesn't like it'll freak him out but he can withstand looking at horrible shambling monstrosities and that kind of yeah and stab them and then stab them yeah <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, that's uh, for the Robert E. Howard podcast. I don't want to get off on, on that tangent. But the forums are great. You know, I go check them out when I can, and there's really good stuff there and, and lots of good conversation and things that we miss constantly. Right. Oh, I did notice that on the first week when we were talking and, and I mentioned Loft Horizon, somebody posted on the main website this amazing photograph. Of oh, all right. It's like a miniature set. From the I really recommend people check that out because that was incredible. I'd not seen that before. That was brilliant. And they also put up, um, what do you call it, the uh, natural the formation. The Giant's Causeway. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. And then somebody <laughs> put up a map of Hy- Hyborea. Yeah, and somebody put up an actual map of the Conan lands and circled that Hyperborea was there so that I wasn't that crazy. Back to that topic of the freezing of this city. I mean, so things just got too cold. Now, there was this kind of 
abyssal city that the elder things had fled to and actually they were kind of living seasonally at some point right right? where they still used this city up there but then they also lived down there because it's warmer it's closer to the earth's core right and they also had heating devices keep their domiciles warm and stuff (laughs) yeah i know i love that that near the end of their time in the city they had heating devices and winter travelers were represented as muffled and protective fabrics (laughs) and i just imagine it's like a scene from a christmas carol or something you know (laughs) elder things and mufflers walking through downtown caroling together (laughs) you know there's one old one up on a balcony shaking his fist. <laughs> the cold slowly drives them under, and eventually they... It, it, near the end of their time in the city, though, they say that they did have to adapt some Shoggoths to land use again, which was kind of forbidden since they had that war. Mm-hmm. You know, they intimate that Shoggoths were back up on the surface of the planet again, but eventually they uh, they have to kind of retreat to the abyss where they have right. their home. And yeah. as far as we know, it's still there. They might have a city down there even now. Yeah. yeah. All these tunnels lead to this big black abyss, and they never explain what is down there in this abyss. Although they do make a reference to something, and tell me if you guys know what this is or not, but it said, had the killer whale theory really explained the savage and mysterious scars on Antarctic seals noticed a generation ago by Borch Grevnik. Grevink? Borch Grev. Do you guys know anything about this guy? Borch Grevink? Is that uh, how it's pronounced? Uh, yeah, he was a Norwegian explorer, and he took um, expedition down in the Arctic back in 1898. Lovecraft reports that when he was 10 years old, uh, the Borshagravaginik expedition, which had just made a new r- record in the South Polar Achievement, greatly stimulated his interest in the Antarctic. The mention of the scars on Antarctic seals derives from Carl Fricker's The Arctic Regions, uh, a book Lovecraft owned. Though Borovajarubra lately mm-hmm. noted scars of wounds upon some seals, which led him to believe in the existence of some mysterious, powerful beasts of prey, it has been conclusively proved that these wounds were inflicted by the teeth of a ferocious Leorca gladiator. By a whale. Yeah, by a whale. Because Lovecraft kind of throws it out there at the end of uh, Chapter 8. Right. As if we all know what that is. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so the end of Chapter 8 also marks the end of the second installment, as it was originally published in Astounding Tales. Ah, okay. So chapter nine goes into the third installment. And in chapter nine, it kind of, there's a tonal shift as well. We've spent that whole middle section of the story learning the whole history of the world, the history of these creatures, and uh, we're straight up back into action squad time by the time we get to to chapter nine. The guys are thinking they have to get back to uh, their camp, but they want to figure out where this portal is to the nighted abyss. That's mm-hmm. the last thing they want to check out, and then they need to get back because they're running out of battery power on their flashlights, right? Yep. Yeah. You know, there's still a whole paragraph where he talks about what they're doing with their supplies of notebooks and whatnot. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. you know? So there's a little wordiness here as well. Yeah. They take off to go find this passageway, and it says they'd wormed themselves closely to the site of the tunnel's mouth. When Danforth key nostrils, he smells something really foul. Danforth is like Wolverine. He's got hyper senses. I know. I love that, that <laughs> when, you know, when he it's Danforth's keen nostrils that first yeah. <laughs> and it's smell. hearing he's the one that could always hear the piping in the distance and it's something like a scent of the other things that they'd uncovered before when they right. saw the dissected specimen there's there's this terrible smell now all, all this whole area has been is kind of cluttered up with debris which which will come into play later right exactly there's debris everywhere um, also combined with the smell the scent of elder thing that they're picking up mm-hmm. uh, they begin to smell common petrol everyday gasoline and that means that there's a guy with a chainsaw at the end of the chamber. Of what? Course. No, I know wait, that Chad, smell. That's not it. No, that's not it, Chad. That's no. Oh. But what it does mean is that somebody or something is using gasoline. A lot of the, the stuff at the camp was missing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Could be Gedney or it could be something else. Who knows? Could be the dog. Could be the dog. They find a doorway where the smell is strongest, the smell of elder thing and gas. And it looks like a path has been cleared there recently of right. some kind. Uh, when they enter, at first, you know, it seems to be just more debris, but then they realize that some of it are remnants of what came from the camp. There's tin cans, there's books, there's a heater, and um, there's some paper, and there's even some kind of screwed up illustrations on the paper. And and, and Belize hears that faint musical piping again as well. That they've been hearing the whole time. And is it the wind, or is it, what is it? Well, I, I like the fact that the, the elder things, or whoever had this stuff from the camp, kind of made some drawings. That basically tells those guys that they had done the same thing that Dyer, Dyer and Danforth were doing what these kind of alien fugitives had done before them. They had gone to what they assumed was their last home, and then they, through the art and the things that had been laid down, realized that everybody had abandoned it and gone to this undersea kingdom. And right. so 
they were just trying to seek that out as well, right? Right. Well, I mean, that's the impression that I got. So did you, I mean, did you get that impression as well, Ian, that, that these elder things weren't from this city, that they were maybe elder things from another place and they came to explore and then they got caught, you know, millions of years ago in the ice? We get that covered later on, but at this point, I think it was just a case of... Um... I quite liked how it opened up with the allusion again to it possibly being Gedney, but not possibly, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. Well, what I think is that they're from this city. I thought that. And that then when they wake up, they go back to the city and then they go, oh, this isn't here anymore and nobody lives here. And they do the same thing that Dyer and Danforth do. They look at the art and they figure out what happened to everybody. And so they're trying to get to that undersea world. Yeah. Where everybody is. Where, Where they're originally found. If you recall, they're found in a chamber that essentially everything is washed down from this jungles up above and things like that, from a, mm-hmm. a, from a different age, is also flushed out through these caves. But they were buried in there, right, which right. is quite different to actually being yeah. flushed down with the rest of everything else. They were pr- deliberately buried, buried in there. They do think that perhaps it is still Gedney, but when they see these illustrations, you know, this is this art is very sophisticated and it's very similar to the bas-reliefs and the sculptures that they've been seeing. So right. whomever made these drawings on the paper, Gedney couldn't have executed this kind of sophistication. I mean, he's only ever drawn mustaches on guys in magazines. <laughs> you know, they know that Gedney is his really juvenile with his art. You know, yeah. so he's putting a piece That's, That was in Lovecraft's original manuscript that was never yeah. published. Yeah, yeah, he talks about Gedney, uh, Gedney yeah. having to do mustache, and you fill in one of the teeth on every on one person too, so it looks like yeah. I'm missing. Yeah, he's ruined all of Dyer's magazines. He knows that he he knows that he couldn't have executed this art. So. You know, Dyer's just saying, look, man, we still had the the curiosity was upon us, the, the madness of discovery. He says, uh, perhaps we were mad, for have I not said those horrible peaks were mountains of madness? I just wanted to say, yes, you have. You've said that quite a lot, <laughs> actually, in this story. You've squeezed in the title as much as you can. <laughs> it's everywhere. Yes, you have said that. They leave this place where they found the remnants of the camp. And they, they continue to search, and eventually they find this giant stone ramp. He does this a couple of times in the story. He kind of goes over and he says, you know, the reasons why we were doing this. And he kind of tries to explain away himself all the time as to why they would be doing this. Right. Including why they go up and they look in the mountains, why they would go on a recce and, and uh, have a look. But he really covers himself off in, I think, chapter three by saying they have this uh, same old age-long pursuit of the unknown. Much earlier on, he actually covers it that way. And I sort of think that that's all you need to know, really. It, right. They want to find out. It's the scientists. This is what they do. Right. Absolutely. And that's why he continues to explain the stuff away and say, yeah. you know, I understand that you might think we're crazy for digging into this more, but that's what we did. We had to. They explore a little more past that room and they find this giant stone ramp, which wa- winds way up into the sky and is, and it also winds down. And yeah. they believe this is the entrance to those sort of subterranean land. And it's engineered in a real peculiar way. Again, they kind of wish Peabody was there so he could tell them, how is this structure even being held together? It doesn't make right. sense. But they decide, you know what, this is actually, not only is this a good way to explore downward, but also this will be a good way to leave because it will put us out kind of not too far from our plane. So this is sort of the new setting. While they're there by that ramp, they see the three sledges which had been missing from Lake's camp. Danforth, his his sharp vision senses something in the floor you know like he sees you know his heightened Mm. senses Danforth is the best at what he does and what he does ain't pretty (laughs) which is fly planes and find monsters the really great shock came when we stepped over and undid one tarpaulin whose outlines had disquieted us It seems that others, as well as Lake, had been interested in collecting typical specimens, for there were two here, both stiffly frozen, perfectly preserved, patched with adhesive plaster where some wounds around the neck had occurred, and wrapped with care to prevent further damage. They were the bodies of young Gedney and the missing dog. Oh, God. No! And at this point, you sort of think, okay, so it wasn't Gedney. <laughs> <laughs> Mystery finally solved. I mean, if, you're quite, if you're completely clueless, you're sitting there thinking, so who was it? Who could it have been? <laughs> well, who it did it? The dog. It wasn't the dog either, yeah. That was my second go-to guy, but that yeah. you know, ties up two loose ends right there. 
<laughs> Despite all that, even in death, the two, the dog and Gedney, are wearing lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But so that ends chapter 9, and it brings us into chapter 10. This is one of my favorite parts of the story, is this section here, because they begin to hear some sounds, and not the piping that they had come to expect. No. Uh, you know, He's it like, says, Wait. to be brief, it was simply the raucous squawking of a penguin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They enter the tunnel where they're hearing the noise from, and eventually a penguin does show up, but it's not just any kind of penguin. Uh, giant albino penguins with no eyes. They have no eyes, yeah. Yep. Giant, six feet tall, eyeless and albino penguins. But he gives them eyelids. He does. Which I thought was kind of a bit weird, because surely if they've evolved, you know, they've bred and whatever since then, they would just have the pits where eyes would have been, and the skin would have grown over because they have no use for lids, because they have no eyes. Not that I'm complaining, it's still scary, <laughs> it's a really good image, but it's kind of, I just kind of thought... Well, Surely they wouldn't have it. Why have they got eyelids if they have no eyes? It depends on how... Well, the, obviously at one point they did have eyes, and they've over... Yeah. It takes it takes a while for evolution to completely do away, you know, like their a vestial... A long time. Yeah, it's their vestial things. <laughs> you know, it's like we, you know, we yeah. still have appendix, but we don't use it for anything. So they still yeah. have their eyelids, but they don't use them. You know, uh, you know Lovecraft's not a, a biologist. He's a, you know, a science fiction horror writer. No, nope, fair enough. These aren't completely unknown. I, I think that these penguins, these six-foot-tall penguins, are based on the very sexily named Anthropornis. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's a genus of giant penguin. It lived about 45 to 37 million years ago. And they yeah. found fossils of it on Seymour Island off the coast of Antarctica and then also in New Zealand. So oh, okay. at some point there were gigantic uh, penguins walking the earth. And I believe that Lovecraft's idea was that these are descended or evolved from those Anthropornis penguins <laughs> did they have an am- anthropornis name that, I, that, that's the name of the penguins man no, the name of the first pet and i'm over <laughs> <laughs> sassy maple the question at this point though is what sent those penguins a questing out from their rookery why are they just wandering about instead of hanging out with their uh you know their brothers and sisters he also does mention here that their squawking is uh undoubtedly in the dutch language which adds an element of horror. <laughs> You know, the penguins are just kind of blindly wandering around since I heard Danforth aren't that worried about it. They kind of leave them, but they're squawking, and they continue to descend. And they don't seem too bothered at all by Danforth, yeah. and so they just sort of walk right by him, and the penguins don't No, they figure it out, yeah. don't they? If they kind of stay out of their way, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they'll be okay. They continue descending, and finally they come across this vast entryway, they, this inverted hemisphere, and they realize that this is the, this is the entrance to the abyss. This is the way that you go. And it gets a lot hotter there. In fact, they have to start removing their garments. It's getting so hot. Yeah. <laughs> Poor no penguins have got it all planned. Exactly. <laughs> when you go into the uh, the lair of the anthropornis, suddenly everything's a lot hotter. Hot and the lights are dim. And... You sit down, and then the penguin creeps up and starts giving you a massage. What, what is going on? <laughs> What do you think the uh, uh, say that, that Guillermo del Toro form, film had been made and At the Mountains of Madness was suddenly a, a very popular thing? What do you think the uh, the title of the pornographic knockoff movies would be? I would say At at Her Mound of Madness. Ooh, <laughs> yes, I like that. Well, that's one I definitely would like to see some forum topics on. What would be, uh, <laughs> What are some possible titles for the very X-rated version of this? I can see the comments to this episode right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. They're going to be good. I can't wait. That's when people really get creative. So through this giant sort of uh, entrance to the abyss, there's a tunnel, and, and they go through there. As they're going, they find more stuff from Lake's camp. And suddenly, at one point, the tunnel, it gets really long and wide. It's like 70 feet, 75 feet long by 50 feet broad. And when they look at the carvings here, they represent sort of a sudden degradation of skill. The art is not as good as it's been thus far. In fact, it's really crude, very primitive. Primitives were trying to mimic what the other things were doing. And another thing about this particular area is that the, the floor was completely polished and almost glistening. They get to the end of the, the abyss and there's this big kind of mist that's rolling up out of there. Right. It's, it's, got a cra- you know, it's got a crazy smell. The penguins are leaving this area. And yeah. whatever they're leaving, it's it's down there. And that's yeah. where we end chapter 10. <laughs> it is where we end chapter 10, and it's uh, probably a good time to pause. When we come back next time, we're going to have the thrilling conclusion of At the Mountains of Madness. It'll be yeah. our seventh episode of this, so this this will be the most uh, number of episodes we've dedicated to a story. But it's been absolutely. Well, worth it, I think. well, I think Mountains of Madness absolutely deserves it. Yeah. I want to thank uh, Ian for, for stepping in. Ian, you're going to join us for the last episode, right? 
I will, yeah. Yahoo! Wunderbar! We'll be mad to just, nah, nah. <laughs> Lena, I've had enough of you. Yeah. You're porno penguins. <laughs> you, you've cheapened this. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank uh, also Reber Clark for his great music, for, for letting us mm -hmm. use that. And you can also get a hold of this music uh, from Amazon, and we'll put a link up to where you can get uh, Reber's album of, of this music. Yeah, and if you're outside of the U.S., Reber has also set up a band camp site, uh, which we'll put up on the show notes. So you can go to the Amazon site or you can go to Bandcamp, and from there you can get the Mountains of Madness music. And you can actually, from the Bandcamp site, you can also get the Lovecraft Paragraphs music. Uh, which we've also used on the show quite a bit. And uh, also, since we're a tiny bit shorter on the show length this time, we'll be using as outro music another track from Australian mythos hip-hop group Humanoids. You remember earlier we did the McMurdo Boogie track. This time we're using a track called Arkham Sir. I really dig it. You'll be hearing it momentarily. And it's also available at Bandcamp. Of course, I'll put up a link for that. I want to thank Mike Mann for doing our technical stuff and Brooke Burgess for our great interning. Yeah, I just made that <laughs> and, up. And uh, also our reader today, Joe Freya, he's going to be with us for the conclusion as well. And special thanks to our sponsor this week, the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. Go check out their radio adaptation of At the Mountains of Madness, as well as their uh, uh, German adaptation of The Color Out of Space, Die Farb. Die Farb, yes. And that's at CthulhuLives.org. That's all we got for this week. Uh, once again, I am Chad Pfeiffer. I'm Chris Lackey. And I'm Ian Colbot. And this has been the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. At HPPodcraft.com. Do you know what? What? This whole galaxy, the whole universe, used to be compressed into a tiny spot this big. And and you know what happened? What? It went and blew up. All the spark, everything was flying all over the place in form space. It was just gas. It was floating around. The Earth was. Yeah, the Earth was really gas. And, and the sun formed, and it was so hot that, that the earth just formed into one hard, big ball, ball yeah. of ocean, of mud ocean. Yeah. So there were sea animals, and under the water, volcano vent. The earth is round, galaxy is spiral, cells are stardust, DNA is viral, language is selfish. Fibonacci shellfish, walls built with things you haven't dealt with, balls, super string, tongue tied in knots, blood that doesn't stop, wounds that won't clot, radio telescopes regurgitate codes, I'll be in Arkham, sir, when the sun implodes. The earth is round, galaxies spiral, cells are stardust, DNA is viral, language is selfish, Fibonacci shellfish, walls built with things you haven't dealt with, balls, a super string, tongue tied in knots, blood that doesn't stop, wounds that won't clot, radio telescopes regurgitate codes, I'll be in Arkham, sir, when the sun implodes. Grandma told me that him and I are not what they seem. Shut your eyes and you'll burst into flames I was born in Arkham with my doppelganger's name We may look the same, but I play two-faced with coin toss Heads let go, tails you suffer a loss It's a strange kind of roulette, begins with a debt You'll never find Alia unless your feet get wet Unless you see the spare caravan You'll need yourself a seer, and I guess I'm your man Wind walking with an ethereal agility You want up on the depths, have you got ability? Something tells me that stars are unbalanced I can still feel the ripple of the Big Bang's malice When the asymmetry gets you down Remember that the supernova goes without a sound There's ripples in the pond right now So dip in and fill your flag and full of doubt It's the now now, so see your haters later No time to debate, nowadays The Miskatonic library opens up late I'll see you in the morning, at a quarter to eight I light a candle at night, so my heart stays white It's the king in yellow now dressed in red While beasts lick his hands while he's burning beds We keep it up while the world's gone mad It's hard to find the light with dreams twisted and sad Language is selfish, we're all greedy I won't make a move if it doesn't please me Release me, this haunter of the dark Show me your starry wisdom, your divine spark I had a dream last night, I had the strangest dream I stretched from here to Pleiades on a single beam My oversoul rode the stream like sticks And timpani rolls replaced all my bass kicks And the French horn lifted me up to rhyme Where the feather serpent hangs eternally dying And I'm a die trying, unshackled this sun Before I reach boiling point my song is sung I've been through the desert and the arc of the sun Come full circle, counting backwards to one. So sit back, sink in regression. In atavistic states, I await with a blessing. The earth is round, galaxy is spiral. Cells are stardust, DNA is viral. Language is selfish. Fibonacci.
bunch of shellfish balls built with things you haven't dealt with balls. Super string tongue tied in knots, blood that doesn't stop, wounds that won't clot. Radio telescopes regurgitate take codes of an arc absurd when the sun implodes. The earth is round, galaxies spiral, cells of stardust, DNA is viral. Language is selfish, Fibonacci shellfish balls built with things you haven't dealt with balls. Super string tongue tied in knots, blood that doesn't stop, wounds that won't clot. Radio telescopes regurgitate codes of an arc absurd. The whole universe used to be compressed into a tiny spot this big. And, and you know what happened? What? It went and blew up. All the spark, everything went flying all over the place. It formed space. Thank you.